as we stand and sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. It's number 2088 in the faith we sing. It's number 2088 in the faith we sing. Let's stand and sing to the Lord.
superintendents. Have you figured out I have a new nickname for Eric? Uh, Ed Sullivan. <laughs> Sullivan in the way that he speaks and does his introduction. Just uh, <laughs> one of the most pretty special blessings of uh, faith camp that we have hosted this week. You're going to see more of our faith campers in the worship service today. We appreciate each one of them. Again, we welcome every one of you to worship. We're so glad that we're coming here just to set aside everything else in life and just express our love to Jesus. Just let him know how grateful we are to him. Uh, a couple things do want to turn your way. Uh, I would ask you after worship, take a good look at your bulletin, the announcements. I would highlight that the youth meet today at 5 o'clock in the youth room. Uh, and then this Friday, they are heading out to Spiritus for a, uh, a good weekend at the beach to get revived and to be challenged in their faith. Uh, our average age in worship next Sunday will drop dr drastically due to that, but uh, we'll keep on going despite that. But I uh, just wanted to share that with you. Uh, oh, go up. Excuse me. I'm kind of brain dead this morning. But, uh, so. but uh, also want to let parents know youth and children's permission forms uh, need to be turned in by early September. You can find some of those outside the Wesley room. You can also find them on our website. We need to have that important information for your youth and children to participate in our activities. Uh, a couple meetings coming up this week. You'll note the ones for Methodist Women and the Fall Festival Committee. Also, the end of September, we're going to be uh, working real hard on our church photographic directory. That's the date of the photographs, but you can go ahead and register and schedule your spot online this month if you do that. You get gift certificates and coupons that will save you money toward purchasing your own photographs. So please keep that in mind. Go ahead and start signing up and scheduling today. Uh, also, we do want to uh, express a word of sympathy today uh, to the family of Larry Clark. Larry was the father of Jerry Tickle and Sherry Smith. And we just pray God's comfort and strength for each and every one of them. So just wanted to share that little bit with you. Well, somebody toward the end of the week asked me how I was doing, and looking back over three years as your pastor, I said to them, uh, this is one of the most wonderfully exhausting weeks I've had. We had a, a great time of faith camp Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 8 in the morning, 3 in the afternoon, nine young people from our church family, and we just had a, a, a wonderful time together. So uh, what I would like to do, first of all, is to introduce our campers. And then we're going to share a little bit about what we have learned together this past week. So as I call your name, if you please stand, come and stand. Uh, Eric Allen, uh, Madeline Dabbs, Andrew Hamilton, Aaron Hawkins, Charlotte Hicks, Zachary Crapiz, Austin Roberts, and Bryant Walker. Here they are, uh, our, our faith campers this week. We're so proud of each and every one of them. Uh, we've had a lot going on. We've learned a whole lot. Uh, Monday, the focus of the day was about the love of Jesus and receiving his love. Tuesday was about loving Jesus back. Wednesday was about reaching out and loving other people in his name by serving them. And Thursday was about making heart commitments to believe in Jesus and to follow Jesus. And it's just been a, a great four days with each and every one of them. We did learn a lot of things. Uh, we learned things like we got a problem. Sin. God's got a solution. Jesus. We got a decision. Believe. What are you going to do about it? Sir. All righty, there we go. They're awake a little bit today. So we learned kind of the, the gospel <laughs> message in a nutshell that way this week. Uh, we learned again about what it means to serve Christ, to show His love to our world. We learned about our, our unique part as United Methodist in the overall body of Christ. We learned that the Methodist movement was started by a man named who? John Wesley. John Wesley, the man who loved to ride what? Horses. But he did not like to wear what? Wigs. He didn't like to wear wigs. That was a new part of John Wesley I learned this week. So it's a, Always a great experience uh, when you learn new things. So, how many of you today love to eat onions? You love onions? 
these kids know how to plant some onions. Wednesday, we took them up to War Street Mission, and they got to work serving, working in a community garden that, that where they grow food that goes to needy families. They planted onions, and they loved every bit of it. Nobody cried or anything, right? But they, they just had a wonderful time of service up there. Well, it was more than just the nine of us that you see right now. Uh, Marcus Connor can't be with us this morning. We want to remember all their family in prayer. Uh, but aside from us, we had a lot of adult volunteers who helped to make this week very special, serving lunch meals to us, sitting in and assisting the different sessions, rehearsing with us at the piano. The adults who helped with faith camp, yeah, please stand just a moment. We want to recognize you and, and say thank you. All of those who helped out. Here we go. Well now, uh, we want to get to the serious part, and that is that based upon decisions that each one of them have made this week, special times of prayer with each one of them, they want to believe in Jesus and they want to follow Jesus, and they want to share that commitment to you and with you publicly right now. I want to ask each of them to turn and face me as they do. I want to ask the parent of each and every one to just come and stand with them at this time, please. Grandparents, I'd like to accommodate grandparents. We just don't have room. I don't know if we have room for the parents down here. But, uh, but we're just, uh, we thank mom and dad. Everybody else needs to turn around to mom and dad just say thank you right now for all they've meant to you. All the ways they've been a blessing in your life. But with mom and dad uh, standing beside you right now and right behind you, I want to ask you these important questions about your faith. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. Okay. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Okay. That is your profession of your faith in Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that today. We give thanks to God for that. Our next question is in associating you with that part of the overall body of Christ called the United Methodist Church. As members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? Okay. And now, much more specifically, in associating with Archdale United Methodist Church, I ask you this question. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? All right, I want to ask each of eight of you to just kneel at the altar right now. Mom and Dad, you may want to put a hand on each shoulder, and we want to have a special prayer for all eight of these. Let's all pray together as a church family. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great love, the way you've showed it to us most of all in your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for each and every one here today who has made a decision to believe in Jesus and to follow Jesus. I ask you to bless each one right now as I pray for Eric, as I pray for Madeline, as I pray for Andrew, as I pray for Aaron, as we pray for Charlotte, as we pray for Zachary, as we pray for Alston, as we pray for Brian. Fill each one of them with your Holy Spirit and your love. I pray for their parents that you would use them to strengthen them in their faith. I pray that all of us as a church family would love them, support them, encourage them, and lead them in every way. And we pray, Lord, that you would just 
use what's going on right now and what's going to happen in the remainder of our time of worship to bring every one of us back to that point of asking what it means to believe in you and to follow you. We thank you for everything now as we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. At this time, the parents can be seated. We're not having a children's message today, but we do have children's church. So as the parents are heading back, the children for children's church can head out with Debbie in this direction. There is no joy worship today, but children's church, the kids can head out this way. Miss Debbie's leading them. and for the freedom we have to come together to worship you. We thank you for this church and for the week we had at Faith Camp. Thank you for Stuart and the other leaders who gave their time so that we could learn more about your love and how we can become more like you. We praise you for the food on our tables, the clothes that we wear, and that you made us able to get out of bed and come to this place. Put in our way opportunities to serve others and help us to remember that in all things we are to do as if unto you. Lord, we pray a special prayer for those who are sick and those who are lost. We ask that your hand heal, comfort, and guide them as they seek your will. We lift up all the requests listed in our bulletin, as well as those on the hearts of today, every, everyone here today. You know each need, and we give them over to you. Finally, we pray, Lord, that as Stuart speaks today, you have each person hear what you want them to hear. That when we leave, we shine a brighter light in a dark world. We love you for grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. In Jesus' name. Please join me as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven.
offering. Let us pray as we prepare to give. God, you have given us everything. We are so thankful. Please receive this offering with grateful hearts and use it for your work in the world. Amen.
This morning our scripture is from Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Since we are surrounded by so many examples of faith, we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially sin that distracts us. We must run the race that lies ahead of us and never give up. We must focus on Jesus, the source and goal of our faith. He saw the joy ahead of him, so he endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace it brought him. Then he received the highest position in heaven. He went next to the throne of God. Thank you very much, uh, Austin, for sharing the scripture with us. Thank you to all of our faith campers for helping to lead worship today. Let's let them know again how much we appreciate it. Well, today we're continuing, we're concluding a series of messages, a contest of Olympic proportion. We look at living the Christian life through a lot of the images and events of, of the Olympic Games. How many of you have been enjoying the Olympics? How many have you? All righty, all right. Let's just open it up to everybody. What's been your favorite sport? Somebody tell me. Gymnastics. Volleyball. Gymnastics. Diving. Swimming. Water polo. Water polo. Now there is a unique person. Okay. All righty. And what was the name of the sport where they were dancing with the ball yesterday? I couldn't figure that one out for some reason. Okay. All righty. Well. I trust all of you have been enjoying the Olympics and uh, looking at different events. Uh, I noticed this year there's some events that were not included, like uh, they have removed women's softball from Olympic competition. And I thought, you know, we live down south where we love softball, I wish that would have been included. There's other southern events, though, that are not included in the Olympics either. And you know, because of that, every year in May, in East Dublin, Georgia, they host the Redneck Games. Anybody familiar with the Redneck Games? They have some sports, some activities that are just unique to the southern United States. They have sports like watermelon seed spinning. They have bobbing for pig's feet. They have hubcap hurl. And my favorite is mud pit belly flop. You don't even need to describe that one. You can just see the image in your mind, can't you? Well, like so many of you, I have enjoyed the Olympics, too, and uh, one of my favorite events to watch is in the track and field events. You know how much running was a big part of my life years ago, and it would be the 10,000 meter run. They had that event last weekend. It's 25 laps on the track, 6.2 miles, and the person who won the gold medal this year, 27 minutes and 30 seconds. 6.2 miles that fast. I just thought that was amazing. But uh, I like that event because that was the event I ran when I ran track and field in, in high school and then in college. And you know, I got to thinking about the second time I ever ran a 10,000 meter run. It was in the, the fall of 1983. I was a, a sophomore at Brevard College, two friends of mine, and, and I, we were driving from Brevard over to a wonderful place called Lake Junaluska. We were going there to run a 10,000 meter run race and, and our practice was to always show up an hour and a half ahead of time, right over the course, see what the course was going to be like, <coughs> register, stretch, warm up, and then run the race. Well, somewhere between Brevard and Lake Junaluska, we made a wrong turn. We got to Lake Junaluska with just a half hour to spare. And so we did register, we did warm up, but I had no idea what that race course was going to be like. And I had only run one 10K before. So I just said in my mind, I don't know where this course is going, but I am going to finish this race. The gun went off and I took off running, thinking I'm going to finish this race. And we went uphill and downhill, uphill and downhill, uphill and downhill. If you've been to Lake Tulaska, I didn't need to tell you that, did I? There are hills and there are mountains everywhere. After several miles of doing that and saying, I'm going to finish this race, we ran all the way around that lake and I'm thinking, I'm going to finish this race. We crossed over the dam and, and there we started this long, grueling uphill climb. I'm thinking, I'm going to finish this race. Made it to the top of the hill, that big, beautiful white cross. And down in the distance, 
Way beyond the auditorium, you could see the finish line. And I just took off running downhill and I crossed the finish line. And I don't know what my time was. It was a lot slower than 27 and a half minutes, believe me. But I was just thrilled because I had finished the race. And I had been saying over and over again, I am going to finish this race. My brothers and sisters, we are running a race today. We are running a race. And we don't always know where that course of the race is going to go. We don't know what the full distance is going to be, but we are clear of our goal in this race. In this race, we are to follow Jesus no matter what. And our goal in this race is that we follow Him. We would grow and we would become more like Him. And the challenge before every one of us today is to run this race of following Jesus with that outlook that says, I am going to finish this race. Listen to how Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 puts it. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Don't you love that picture, a great cloud of witnesses? It's describing those, first of all, who have gone on ahead of us in living life for God and living as followers of Jesus Christ. In the preceding chapter, chapter 11, it names off all these great characters of our Old Testament, people who believed in God and people who served God. Now, for our purposes, we can look back over past history. Christians over 2,000 years of, of Christian history who have believed in Jesus and loved Jesus and lived for Jesus. But you know what else? We can also think of this cloud of witnesses as those people who are running with us today and following Jesus. That includes mom and dads and grandmas and grandpas and dear friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. As together, we're running this race of following Jesus. And when you think about those who've already run the race, and when you think about all of those who are running the race with us today, it helps to say, I'm going to finish this race. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. Folks, when you make a decision to believe in Jesus and to follow Jesus, obstacles are going to pop up. Barriers are going to come out of nowhere. First of all, Satan's going to be upset. But then some other people are going to get upset too. And all of these barriers are going to crop up in the way to try and hinder you. In 1924, the Summer Olympics were held in Paris, France. And, and the person predicted to win the 100-meter dash was a young man named Eric Little from Great Britain. He was predicted and he was looked at as the fastest person in the world. But as the schedule of events was handed out, it was noted that, that some of the preliminary events for that 100 meter dash were going to take place on Sunday. Eric Little was a devout Christian and he had made a commitment years before. He would never compete on the Lord's Day. And so he pulled himself out of the 100 meter dash and he entered the 400 meter run, a longer race, a more grueling race. He didn't know if he had the endurance to compete well in that event. But still, he went through the preliminary rounds. He made it to the final round. And in one of the great surprises and upsets, he won the gold medal in that event. Not only did he win the gold medal, he inspired that movie, Chariots of Fire. And he lived the rest of his life as a missionary serving Jesus in the country of China. But you know, I think about all of those barriers he had to his goal. He didn't let that get in his way. He said, I am going to finish this race. Folks, barriers are going to pop up from time to time. But we got to keep saying, I'm going to finish this race. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Folks, even when you make a decision to believe in Jesus, as these young people have, even when we say we're going to follow Jesus, sin still going to pop up. Folks, I don't want to admit to you, and you're going to do something wrong if you don't already know it. I fail, I sin every day. And every one of us do. 
And you know what that sin wants to do? As it says in the scripture, it wants to entangle us. It wants to trip us up. Sometimes it's our own sin that will trip us up and we'll say, what's the point in following Jesus if I'm going to fail like this? But we've got to keep going. Sometimes, though, it's the sin of other people and other groups of people. In 1936, the Summer Olympics were hosted in Berlin, Germany. At that time, Adolf Hitler had been in power just about three years. He was so glad to be hosting the Olympics. He was going to showcase to the world what Germany was going to become. And he saw it as a platform to tell the whole world that that blonde-haired, blue-eyed, fair-skinned Aryan race was superior to every other race, especially the African race. Competing for the United States that summer, was a young man named Jesse Owens, an African-American man. He knew what Hitler and what Germany believed and what they were propagating. He could have been intimidated, couldn't he? He could have said, I'm scared. He could have said, I'm going to stay home. He could have said to his teammates, we should all stay home. But what did he do? He went to Berlin, Germany, and he won four gold. You know, despite the sin, despite the hatred, despite the prejudice, he said, I am going to finish this race. Despite the sin that we fall to from time to time, despite the sin and behaviors of other people, we got to say, I'm going to finish this race. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Perseverance is the word that jumps out in that phrase. we got to keep on going no matter what. No matter what hinders us, no matter when the sin tries to entangle us, entangle us we have got to keep persevering. In 1948, little girl, African-American girl named Madeline, was born in Cleveland, Ohio. She was born into terrible poverty. And at the age of three years old, little Madeline contracted spinal meningitis. At first, the doctors told Madeline's mother, she's not going to make it. But Madeline's mother prayed. The doctor said, I, I, I think she is going to make it, but there's going to be some brain damage. She's going to have some physical challenges. Madeline's mother kept praying. The little girl made it through surgery, and she began to recover. There was no brain damage. There were no physical challenges. She began to grow up as a normal little girl. But there was one thing very abnormal about her. Her teachers noticed in elementary school she could outrun all the boys in class. By the time she reached junior high school, a track coach took note of her and began to train her. By her high school days, she was winning Ohio State championships in track and field, and she received a full scholarship to the University of Tennessee. And in 1968, at the age of 20 years old, Madeline Mims won the gold medal in the women's 800-meter run in Mexico City. You, know, you, you think about all of the hardships she had to face in life. Being born in poverty, nearly meeting death at a young age, facing racism. So many different challenges, so many different hardships, but she persevered. And the Word of God today calls every one of us to persevere in this race of running for Jesus and to run in such a way that we say, I am going to finish the race. Listen to all of verse 1 one more time. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, there's a great temptation in reading that verse. And the temptation is to stop with that one verse and receive it as merely a human pep talk. A human pep talk with a couple of good field good Olympic stories thrown in by the preacher, right? Well, thank God there's verse 2. Because in the second verse, it tells us about the power that helps us to run this race. It tells us about the power that helps us to follow Jesus and to live for Jesus. That power 
is found in none other than Jesus himself. In verse 2, it says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know the good news of those words? is when we choose to believe in Jesus and we invite Him into our hearts and our lives and we experience His salvation and we begin to live for Him, we do not have to do that in our own power. Jesus does that by living in us in the power of the Holy Spirit. And with Jesus in us in that way, we can live and we can say, I want to finish the race. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross. See the first there of a joy that was set before Him. Do you know what kind of joy Jesus knew? The joy of living up in heaven. You know, a great question came up this week in faith camp. Somebody asked, when was God born? It was a great question to ask. God has always existed. God has always existed as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now we cannot comprehend that at all, can we? But God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit have always lived together. And Jesus has known that joy up in heaven. But because of His great love for you and for me, He set aside the joy. He set aside the joy to come and live with us in this world. To come and go through all of life as we know it to teach us who God is, to teach us how to love one another, to perform great miracles, to tell great stories, but ultimately to come into the world, to one day go to a cross and to die, to take upon Himself the punishment for the sins of the whole world. He came in to this world and did that because He loves us that much. And I don't know about you, but when you realize that somebody loves you like that, it's so easy to look at them and to follow them and to say, I am going to finish this race. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. It says there next that he scorned the shame of the cross. What do you think of when you think of the cross? Most commonly, we think of a nice decoration in a sanctuary, don't we? Or we think about a nice piece of jewelry, a necklace with a, 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 a cross dangling from the necklace. We may think of a soldier's grave. We see the cross as a place and an object of honor, right, and reverence. 2,000 years ago, it wasn't that way. 2,000 years ago, a cross was a symbol of shame and humiliation. It was an instrument of execution, the worst kind of execution known. And because of his great love for us, Jesus went to the cross, and he suffered there for every single one of us. He took the punishment for our sins, but then it says here, he scorned the shame of the cross. And how did he scorn the shame of the cross? by defeating the power of death, rising again from the dead. And the good news for every one of us is now that Jesus has lived and died and risen again from the dead, He wants to share His resurrection power with every one of us. Now what's His resurrection power like? What does His resurrection power do? As we come to believe in Him and invite Him into our hearts and our lives, by His resurrection power, He forgives us. He cleanses us. He puts us at peace with God. He gives us a brand new life. He gives us a love, a joy, a peace, a hope, an assurance. And the list goes on and on and on in, in describing this wonderful gift that we call salvation. By His resurrection power, He gives us all of that. But you know what else He gives us? And by His resurrection power, He gives us the power to live for Him run this race. When we look at Jesus and as we look at all that he has done for us, it's so much easier to say, I'm going to follow him and I am going to finish this race. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne 
of God. He lived, he died, he rose again, he ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand side of the throne of God. What's so special about the right hand side of the throne of God? Not much in our 21st century way of thinking. But back in the first century, the right hand side of the throne, that was the place of authority. So it is a reminder to us that now that Jesus has risen from the dead, now that he's ascended to heaven, he's in the place of authority. He is the Lord. He's the Lord of all creation. He's the Lord of this earth. He's the Lord of his church. He's the Lord of Archdale United Methodist Church. And he is the Lord of every person who says yes to Jesus. To everyone who invites Jesus to come into their hearts and their lives. And the good news to every one of us in that is that as we hear the call to run this race from Jesus, not only does He call us to run that race, He lives inside of us, the very same one, guiding us on, leading us on, and because of that, we can say, I am going to finish this race. Folks, we are running a great race. The great race of following Jesus and living for Jesus and desiring to become more like Jesus. And it's not a 100 meter dash. It's not a 10,000 meter run. It's longer than a marathon, longer than an ultra marathon. It's a race that we're constantly running. And we're called to run that race today and to say, I'm going to finish that I have enjoyed the Olympics so much. And I got, I got a confession. When I watch those track and field events, I start having flashbacks. Back to when I ran 20 years and about 50 pounds ago. <laughs> and I look at them compete, even the sprinters. And I start thinking what it must be like to compete on that level. What it must be like to achieve success in that level. What it must feel like to win a gold medal or to set a world record. And every time I think about what that must feel like and the joy that must come with it, it's as if this still, small voice speaks up into my heart and says, yes, Stuart, it is a joy. It is a fulfillment for each one of them to succeed at that level. But then that still, small voice keeps talking. And says, just remember this though, Stuart. The greatest thrill, the greatest fulfillment of all is in knowing and in following and running this race with Jesus. The 1968 Olympics took place in Mexico City. It came to the final day, the final event. It was the men's marathon. And all the competitors gathered there at the Olympic Stadium in Mexico City, representing all these countries from around the world, dozens of them, packed real tight. The gun went off. They ran their first lap and out through the tunnel. They continued that 26-mile, 385-yard race. And after a little more than two hours, the first runner came back in through the tunnel, ran the final lap, and claimed the old medal followed by the silver medalist and then the bronze medalist and all the other runners kept coming in and the crowd cheering all of them on. Well, as they celebrated and began to recover and got lots of water to drink, the winning runner stepped up on the platform to receive the gold with the silver medalist, the bronze medalist at each side. And again, everybody cheered them on as they were presented their medals. And with that final event, people began to leave the stadium. Until a couple hours later, there were only a couple thousand people left in the stadium, and, and those people began to hear the noise of an emergency vehicle. It got louder and louder, and they looked over the tunnel, and in through the tunnel came that emergency vehicle with the lights flashing. And behind it was this one lone runner limping along. His name was John Stephen Akwari, representing the country of Tanzania. And somewhere early on in that marathon race, as they had left the stadium, he had taken a terrible fall. He had injured his knee real bad. He would found something to use as a bandage and wrapped it up, and he would walk a little bit and limp a little bit and try to jog a little bit. 
But now, a full two hours after the last other competitor had completed the race, he came back into the stadium. As everybody realized what had happened, everybody began to stand up and, and cheer him on. And he made that final lap, and he crossed the finish line. And as the medics took care of him, and he began to recover a little bit, a broadcaster came up to him and said, John Stephen, I'm worried. You took a bad fall. You were injured. You got up and kept running. Why didn't you drop out? You had no chance of winning a medal. Why did you keep going? And John Stephen off way, swallowed real hard, looked into the camera, and he said these words. He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start this race. They sent me 5,000 miles My friends, sisters and brothers here today, Jesus has loved you and continues to love you more than you will ever realize. And he invites you to follow him and to finish that race. And you will. As you keep your eyes, your hearts, your lives focused upon him. And as you say, I am going to finish this race. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, thank you for the race that you have run. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for living with us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for rising again from the dead. Thank you for all that it means as we come to believe in you. Thank you for calling us to follow you and giving us the faith to answer that call. We ask you, Lord, to bless each one of us as we run that race every day of following you. Help us to keep our hearts and our lives and our eyes fixed upon you. Help us to run this race together. Help us to glorify you every step. But for all of this to happen, Lord, we need your power. So send your power. Pour out the power of your Holy Spirit upon each one of us. As every day we run and we follow you. We ask it all in your name, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Our final song today is number 2129 in the faith we sing. It's called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Let me ask you today, have you decided to follow Jesus? Have you decided you're going to run that race? <clears throat> have you said, Jesus, I want to give you my life. I want to believe in you. I want to follow you. Perhaps today, you need to make that decision. Our altar's open if you'd like to come and kneel and pray about that. You might want to come and say, Lord, I'm running that race, but sometimes it gets hard. I need your help. You may want to say, Lord, I'm, I'm running the race today and I need your help. I've got a need. You may want to pray for someone today who's running that race. It's hard right now. You just may want to come and thank Him and praise Him for His great love and the joy that you find in running that race and living for Him every day. I just invite you to come and join me as we pray together. Let's stand as we sing number 21, 29. I have decided to follow Jesus.
decided to follow Jesus, to walk out with me, so that every one of you can greet them and welcome them too. But as we do, I trust today that you have decided to follow Jesus and that you're running that race. And realize all along the way that you never run that race alone. That there's Jesus with you in your heart. And there's sisters and brothers all around you. Go now with that good news. Amen.